Hello and welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, and I'm glad that you're here. Our guest is Dr. Rishi Singh. He's with the uh, Cleveland Clinic, and he's joining us here on the program to talk about an unmet need, the unmet need in the treatment of age-related macular degeneration. We'll also uh, talk briefly about uh, a new therapy for retinal rejuvenation therapy by Elix. Welcome to the program, Dr. Singh. Thank you for taking the time. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, um, I did uh, mention that you're with the Cleveland Clinic. What uh, what type of doctor are you? What's your specialty? And, and um, are you practicing in uh, any place else other than Cleveland? Yeah, I'm, I'm a practicing retina specialist here. I've been here on staff now for 12 years. And my focus is our age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and surgical retinal diseases. And I've published extensively in the field. Now, age-related macular degeneration, what is macular degeneration and what's the difference between MD and AMD? Yeah, a, uh, AMD is a leading cause of blindness in the United States. It happens in most patients above the age of 65. Uh, it, it causes a loss of the central vision. Uh, there's two flavors of this, wet forms and dry forms of the disease. Um, the wet form of the disease is something that is aggressive and, and is treated with these injection medications we have now. The dry form of the disease is something we don't have much treatment for right now, and it still can cause significant visual compromise in patients. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes patients complain of difficulty seeing uh, their, their plate uh, faces, recognizing fa uh, objects in front of them that are in the central part of their vision. Those are all common complaints of patients with uh, this sort of condition. So it's you're looking at your plate. You can't see it because it's directly in front of you, but you still maintain peripheral vision. Correct. The the peripheral vision that's part of that is is important to keep, and and that happens with AMD. But centrally, vision is lost, and that's a big detriment to people's ability to act and function independently. Now you mentioned that we don't have a uh, a treatment currently for you, as you say, the dry form of macular degeneration. And is this this is something that is pretty much going to happen around sixty five, sixty, uh, seventy years old? Are, are there forms of this disease that affect and present much earlier in life? Yeah, you know, actually, what one of the the big issues is that this can happen even at earlier phases of life. Sixty five is sort of the time where we start to screen patients with macular degeneration, but we find lots of patients present even earlier than that and they don't even realize they have the disease. Because in the early forms of the disease state, um, patients can be really quite silent. They might not manifest um, uh, sort of, uh, some sort of symptoms initially. And while they might have a strong family history or poor dietary intake of essential nutrients or a smoking history, they don't get evaluated. And so that's a real detriment to uh, making sure that we able, we're able to screen them and evaluate them at a, at a certain age. So you're probably correct. Uh, they probably come in much earlier than we think, uh, below the age of 65. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had much to do with them up until this point. Um, typically, it revolves around smoking cessation, uh, vitamin, uh, diets full of green leafy vegetables, a dose of fish once a week. Those are the typical recommendations for patients who have had um, uh, you know, continued or, or some sort of form of macular degeneration, at least initially. So the person that uh, doesn't smoke, um, lives a healthy lifestyle, eating right, um, exercising, are they much less likely to develop MD or just as likely as anyone else based on the nature of the uh, disease? You know, it's a hot combination of factors. I, I couldn't say one or the other uh, at this point. It's it's a combination of dietary, uh, lifestyle modification. Uh, genetics plays a huge role in this condition, more so than many other conditions you might have heard of, like mm -hmm. breast cancer or even cardiovascular disease. Um, really, we think that genetics plays a huge role in this. So it's, it's a conglomeration of all those together. I can't really say that one is, is particularly imp more important than the other one is. Now, is this a condition that gets progressively worse until absolute blindness takes place, or is it something where you, you can't see your plate because it's directly in front of you, and that's the way it's going to be until treatment is successful? You know, that's actually a sign that the treatment has been, um, that, that either the disease has advanced to the wet form of the disease, or that you have advanced dry disease. And what we're really trying to do in this, this condition is prevent people early in the form of the disease, uh, in the stages where they are, where they might be silent and don't realize there's a, a problem. And those are the patients we need to screen, evaluate, and potentially treat. 
And up until this point, we really haven't had a lot of treatments in that sort of area up, up until the point of this recent study we've had looking at sort of the treatment for the, the management of these patients earlier in the disease state. You know, you mentioned um, patients being silent uh, in the early stages of the disease. Is this because um, there are certain symptoms that, you know, seem like maybe a little bit of dry eye or something like that? Or maybe they've experienced yeah. a trauma and they associate these uh, these symptoms with that trauma. Is that part of the unmet need? And if so, how much of the responsibility to fill this unmet need falls on the patient and how much falls on the caregiver? You know, I, I think that's a great point. Uh, I think the other thing about this is that um, people really feel like at some level that um, their disease as they get older, uh, as you become a um, an older adult, that you should have vision loss and changes in your vision over time. And and that's a that's a, actually an interesting I think phenomenon. I think people have this sort of almost uh, psychology that when they get older, they're not supposed to have as good vision as as other people might. And and that's simply not true. Um, patients in in the late form of their lifetime should have as good of a vision if, as anyone uh, for their 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 state. And in fact, could have twenty twenty five or even twenty fifteen vision. But I think the prevailing mentality has been that there there probably is some patients who believe that um, that there is uh, definitely a, a loss or a detriment of vision over time. And and for that, I think it's just not right for them to necessarily have that sort of mindset because there is a lot we can do for them uh, in their disease state. You mentioned earlier that uh, AMD is the, the number one cause of blindness. Now, that's here in the United States. Is it um, true in other industrialized nations because of, uh, I guess, the, the processed foods? You know, you mentioned diet because of smoking um, and some of these other things. Uh, 11 million folks uh, or more uh, have some form of AMD, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding, and that number is expected to be a double by about 2050 or so. Would you say that uh, environment plays a huge part or at least some part in it aside from the diet and, and the smoking situation. Yeah, you're, you're actually hitting on a really great point, which is that we've done studies looking at this and we find that patients in, in uh, for example, um, Western Europe are at much more higher rates of macular degeneration than Eastern Europeans might be. Mm -hmm. So just the difference in just the European countries, even though the genetics might be sort of the similar in nature, the lineages might be similar in nature, there's a big difference in just the, the locational factors that are involved. We also know that sun exposure is one of the really, really leading causes or the issues that are surround patients with AMD. And so those certainly with uh, increased sun exposure have been thought to have a higher rates of macular degeneration. So a person like me unfor who unfortunately lives in Cleveland, Ohio, might not get as much sun as somebody who lives in California or in Mexico or southern country. And so those patients might have a higher risk of developing macular degeneration over time. Now, you're familiar with Elix, I understand, and they've developed a treatment for AMD. I think it's a really great breakthrough as far as understanding more about this disease state. Um, I, I would say that I think the data is very preliminary. It's very supportive of the idea that there might be a benefit in treating patients with laser for this condition. Mm -hmm. um, what what the, the study really showed was it was a, a proportion of patients who were in the study who actually benefited, um, who did not go on to developing the later forms of, of macular degeneration. And by that, I mean, they didn't go on to developing the vision threatening forms of the disease uh, in a less percentage than those who did not get the laser at all. It actually was a 77% reduction um, in patients who are going on to late forms of disease. And it's sort of a, a breakthrough right now in science because what we're learning about this this treatment is that it can be applied to patients um, even before they develop the actual condition. Uh, the condition I talked to you about before, which is that they could develop really late stages of the disease where they, they lose vision over time, they, we could get them potentially earlier and uh, treat them earlier if we were uh, seeing them and having them evaluated with this sort of laser technology. Um, the data is preliminary right now. It, it's, it's an early trial, but I think there'll be more trials coming. Some of the more interesting data from this trial has really been about um, how patients can potentially uh, benefit by not developing that later condition and what, what sort of phenotypes or sort of uh, clinic pictures have the maximal possible gain. So 
uh, the, what I can say about that is that it's really about patient selection and determining who would benefit from the laser. It's not for everyone, but certainly going to an eye care specialist and talking about it is the first step in determining whether you're even eligible for this sort of treatment. Where can our listeners go and uh, get some more information online about this uh, 2RT therapy developed by Elix and also about uh, your practice there in Cleveland, the, uh, the Cold Eye Institute, uh, Cleveland Clinic? Right. So for my practice, uh, please go on to www.clevelandclinic.org. And uh, if you just Google search the 2RT LEAD study, L-E-A-D study, you'll see a lot of great data and, and a supplement we just recently wrote for one of the more recent journals um, for Retina Today, where we really talked about um, this sort of uh, treatment and what it could allow our patients to do. Uh, I think the data is very compelling. We have to have more studies to show us the benefit of this and the long term, and we should sure will be underway shortly. Well, some great information. Thank you for joining us on the program, Dr. Singh. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again for having me. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in and download at SoundCloud, and be sure and visit our affiliates page at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. Thank you for listening to Health Professional Radio. We're very proud to be an independent broadcaster providing our content free of charge to you, the listener. One of the ways that we're able to remain free and independent is by having people like you become patrons. You can support Health Professional Radio simply by visiting hpr.fm and clicking the button that says Become a Patron. Your patronage of even just $1 a month lets us know that you're there, which in turn makes us more valuable to advertisers. And, of course, if you're able to afford more, then we would certainly appreciate the support. My name is Toby Longhurst from Health Professional Radio. Please visit hpr.fm, click the Become a Patron button and support us if you can.